please. Matthew chapter 13. Somebody remind me. Somebody's in charge. Bill, you're in charge of reminding me of about a few announcements at the end, okay? All right. So if I forget, it's Bill's fault. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13 tonight. Look at with me in verse 44. Matthew chapter 13. Now, I'll give you a fair warning. We are going to be doing uh, some Bible study in Bible study. We're going to be looking around in our Bible tonight, so get your fingers ready. And one of the things that I always do when uh, the pastor gives me a heads up, we're going to be in different parts of the Bible, I try to take everything out of my Bible because you take your Bible and you're flipping your Bible and then stuff starts raining down everywhere. It's a lot harder for me or easier for me to do that because it's up here and it's easier for you because it's in your lap. Uh, but still, then stuff's falling down and you're all distracted and everything. So we're going to be going to the Old Testament. We're going to be going to the New Testament. As we look at these amazing parables tonight, we're in Matthew and chapter 13. Now, I want you to notice, go with me first to verse 36, because this is really important to set the setting of where we're going. And then we're going to drop down to our text verses, verses 45 through 46. Notice here. Then, then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. You see that? So it's very important, I want you to notice, as you look at a Bible passage, and you're trying to understand verses in the Bible, the context is key. You have to answer these questions as you personally, as you, and let me help you out here. When you're reading the Bible, don't just read the Bible to read the Bible. That's not the point. All right, reading the Bible to read the Bible is not the point. And the pastor will say to you often, read your Bible, read your Bible, read your Bible. And sometimes we might get the idea, well, you know what, the, the important thing is just to read the Bible. Well, it is important to read the Bible, but it's important to read the Bible, listen, on purpose, with a purpose. You're, you and I are reading the Bible, listen, to grow. This is spiritual nourishment. This is spiritual food. And so as you read the Bible and study the Bible, you ask these questions, who's talking? Who's talking? Who are they talking to? Why are they talking to them? What's being said, and how does it apply to my life? Those are the questions you need to ask as you read and study your Bible. And so as you're reading it, you have an idea of where you are, what's going on, who's involved, what's being taught or said, and then listen, the final key is how does this apply to my life? Application is key. So we're talking, so here, of course, we're in the New Testament. Jesus is teaching. We've already looked at the first four parables, and he was teaching to the multitudes. And he was teaching to a great group of people, but then all of a sudden we notice in verse 36 there's a change of venue change of location, and now there's a change in tone as well. Now, that brings us up to our passage. Notice here, so if the first thing Jesus does privately is he goes over, he explains it. Can, can I tell you this? If you got a question, you know who you go to first? Jesus. If you had a question about the Bible, listen, Jesus wrote the Bible. He is the Word of God. And the Holy Spirit, who He sent to live in your heart, listen, is the interpreter of the Bible. And so if you have a question about the Bible, now, you're free to ask your pastor, free to ask your Sunday school teacher, but listen, you have direct access. Just go to the author. There's nobody that's going to explain the Bible like the Bible. There's nobody like God that's going to explain the Bible to you. He can do a much better job than I can. Now, notice in verse 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure, hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now here's the parable, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, fifth parable, and he said, listen, let me tell you, my work and, and my, what I'm doing here, what Jesus is doing, was about to do, uh, he said, listen, it's, it's like a treasure that's hid in a field. And, and, and a guy finds that treasure, and, and listen, when a treasure was in the field, if you would go buy the field, you buy the field, you buy the treasure. All right, that was a great deal. Now, but he doesn't end there. Notice in verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, these are twin parables. Parables that are coupled together, there's one great truth 
in two separate parts. And that's what we're going to learn tonight. What was Jesus teaching us in the parable of the treasure and the parable of the pearl? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for so much, Lord, for this wonderful time, uh, Lord, that we've had to study the Word of God, Lord, and Lord, thank you for Wednesday night Bible study. Father, I pray, dear Lord, as we unpack these truths tonight, Lord, I pray that you would help us, help, Lord, our understanding of the Word of God to grow. Lord, help us to understand, Lord, help our appreciation for your wonderful plan, Lord, to increase. And God, help us to grow in our faith. And Lord, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name, and amen. Now, <clears throat> as, uh, as we've gotten into these parables so far, uh, the public teaching of Jesus, we've looked, at, uh, we've looked at the parable of the sower in the field. That was parable number one. Then we looked at uh, the parable of the, 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 the wheat and the tares, all right, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Then last week, we looked at the parable of the mustard tree, and then we looked at the parable of the leaven. And, and if you've been kind of following along, you're kind of, you, you may get the idea, man, this, this thing that God's doing, it's, it's got a lot of problems. Have you ever wondered, have ever, those of you who've been in church uh, for a long time, have you ever wondered why does church, why does the things of God have so many problems? Have you, raise your hand if you've ever wondered that. Why is there so many problems? All right, well, the problem is that there is a devil. Now, if you are not careful, we could sit there and go, you know what, I don't, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if it's all worth it. You, you think about this. Here's the parable of the sower, and he's sowing the word of God. It's Jesus, and it's, it's the Christians. And listen, only one out of six responded with 100% of, uh, return. Only one out of six. That's a pretty, pretty pe measly return. And then you get into the second parable, and the devil's following right after Jesus, and he's sowing all kinds of tears and problems and issues in the church and among the church. And you're thinking, my soul, good night. This is terrible. And then we get into the parable of the mustard tree, uh, and we see that there are people and men and denominations that want to take over the gospel and make it their own and totally pollute it. You know, like, my soul, you... Listen, here's the thing. Now, we could get the idea that God's up in heaven going, oh man, these guys are making a mess out of this. This is, this is not working out like it. Nope. That is not true. When we get into with Jesus and he's in the house, listen, Jesus pulls back the curtain and he shows us from his perspective. Listen, everything that he explained so far was from our perspective. Things down here on earth that we could see, feel, and touch. He said, listen, let me explain to you what's going to happen when I plant my church and it goes forward. There's going to be a lot of issues. Listen, that should make your heart feel at rest. You know what? Everything, all the craziness that's going on, all the, listen, okay, let me point this out. I was going to do this later. <clears throat> All of the wackos, all right, here's a, a, an article that somebody gave me, faith in the metaverse, okay? Now, the metaverse is the little fakey universe uh, that, that they're making online, okay? That, listen, that all your children and all your grandchildren, all your great-grandchildren are getting involved in. And so somebody got the idea, hey, let's plant churches in the metaverse, all right? So you can put on your little VR glasses, all right, and you can float out and you can, you know, you can be a banana, you can be a teddy bear, you can be a robot, you can be a dinosaur, be anything you want. And now you can go to church and you're sitting in your church virtually with your pajamas on, drinking your hot cocoa, and you're sitting next to a banana and a gorilla and, and, and a dinosaur and everything else. And now they're having baptisms. You can get virtually baptized, your avatar can get virtually baptized in virtual water in a virtual church. Good night. I mean, did you ever think of that, cr that craziness? All right. Now listen, listen. But God's plan, listen, God knew it was going to happen. God knew that the, listen, should we share the gospel every single place? D does the gospel need to be in that place? Absolutely. Somebody needs to uh, share the gospel with those dear folks. They're lost. They're, they're going to die and go to hell without Jesus Christ. But my friend, please understand, there's a lot of foolishness that goes on. Now, we get into our parable tonight. Look in your notes here. We're going to jump into your notes. <clears throat> Jesus has now sent the multitudes away and is privately, privately teaching his disciples inside the house. You say, whose house? Well, most likely it was Andrew, or Peter and Andrews. It was right next to the Sea of Galilee right there where he was teaching. Now, in this private venue, the disciples first asked Jesus concerning the, the parable of the tares and the wheat, and Jesus explains it, all right? Now, 
But then he goes on, and the very first thing that he follows up with that, all right, that's important. And let me ask you this. When Jesus does something, is it important, yes or no? Absolutely. Does Jesus know what's best, yes or no? Absolutely. Now, Jesus follows up all of this bad news with two parables that are really good news. That of the twin parables of the treasure and the pearl. That's the next two things you want to write down, the treasure and the pearl. So let's jump right into these. Go back with me to verse 44 of Matthew chapter 13. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto treasure, hid in, now notice he doesn't say a treasure, but treasure, not one but multiple, hid in a field, the which when a man hath found, he hideth. Now that's intriguing. And uh, for joy thereof, he goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. Now, please understand, this may strike you as intriguing. You say, now, why in the world would people have a treasure in the field? That's what banks are for. That's what vaults are for. Now, but please understand, in, in this day, in the, the, the Bible day, they didn't have banks. They didn't have places where you had a safety deposit box or uh, a place where you could go and safely pour it. Some people hid it in their basement. Hey, yeah, you might have had a grandma or a grandpa or aunt and uncle. Listen, they didn't trust the banks, if, especially if they were old enough to have come through the Great Depression and the, and the crash and all of that. Listen, they, they put it in a, a coffee can. Uh, they put it under the mattress. I never figured, uh, forget, forget seeing a picture. One day, uh, there was a uh, man who passed away, and they folks, the family was unloading the house, and they were like, they went to lift up the box springs, and they literally couldn't lift up the box springs, and they cut the thing open, and there was a million and a half dollars in the box springs, all right? And uh, so that's why folks go uh, treasure hauling in, in some of the salvage places, because you never know what you're going to find. But this was very common. Because they didn't have banks and stuff, people needed a place that was safe and secure, so they would go out in these remote fields that nobody owned, it was just wild scrub, and they would find a secluded place, and they'd dig a hole, and they would bury their treasure. And every once in a while, something would happen, and, and it would get unearthed. Now listen, and so if you found a treasure, and you went, and, and you found it, you would go and go down to the registrar's office and say, hey, there's a field way out there, nobody's using it, I want to buy that. All right, you're playing it cool, all right, no, no excitement, just, you know, just who knows, you know, you pay a few bucks for it, it's just vacant land, and you want out the door, yeah, all right, because if you have the deed to the property, you have the deed to everything on the property, and listen, you own, if you own the field, you own the treasure, and that would happen every once in a while. Now, so how in the world is this parable a picture of Jesus' work? Let's look here in our notes. Jesus likens his kingdom as being a treasure hidden in a field. Now, for the joy of finding this great treasure, the finder sells everything, sells everything that he has to legally buy the field to purchase the treasure. So what's the understanding? What's the interpretation? From the prior parables, uh, uh, please remember, as Jesus has been teaching, he's been building these truths, and so we can interpret some of them from what he's already told us. From the prior parables, uh, we know that the field, it represents the world, all right? You can see that in verse 38. The buyer, here in this parable, is the same as the seed sower, and that is Jesus, all right? So the field is the world, the buyer is Jesus, so what is the treasure? The treasure in this case is Israel. The treasure in this case is Israel, his covenant people. Now, you might be saying, well, what about me? I thought for sure, Pastor, you were going to say it was the church. No, 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 we'll, we're going to get to that. It's interesting. Jesus taught this twin set of parables, the treasure and the pearl. In this case, the treasure represents Israel. And later, as we get into the parable, we're going to find about the church is represented by the pearl. Now, uh, there is a reason. Why in the world would Jesus say that the the Israeli people were his treasure when they were actually one of his greatest problems. Well, hold your hand here in Matthew chapter uh, 13 and go back with me to e Exodus. Second book in your Bible, you have Genesis and then you have Exodus. And in Exodus chapter 19, God is redeeming the people of Israel. He's bringing them out of the land of Egypt. I want you to notice in chapter 19 of Exodus, and I want you to notice in verses 5 and 6, what God says about his people. Notice here, he says, now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar, what's that next word? Treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. 
And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of who? Of Israel. God was speaking to Moses. God said, Moses, I want you to let these folks know that, listen, as we enter into this covenant relationship, as they, listen, as they follow me and obey me, what that does is that makes them unto me, unto God, a peculiar. That word peculiar means a distinctive. Uh, We read about that word in the New Testament that we are a peculiar people. Now, peculiar doesn't mean weird or strange. It means easily identifiable, very unique and special. All right? Now, so Israel is God's treasure. As God looks at the earth, he sees two types of people, the Jewish people and uh, the Gentile people. Now, we're going to get into, you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, what about the church and the church age? Doesn't everybody have to be saved in this time and put their faith in Jesus and be a part of the New Testament? Absolutely. But we're going to get to that. All right, now, let's go back to your notes. God is not done with Israel. Please understand, God is not done with Israel. The children of promise through Abraham. The Israeli people are indeed, listen, you think about it, the Israeli people are indeed are scattered throughout the whole earth. Do you know that there are more Jewish people living in New York, the state of New York than there are that are living in the country of Israel? That's a true statement. There are more Jewish descendants of Jewish people living in the United States, in, just in New York City, or not New York City, but New York, than there are living in the land of Israel. And then you go across the earth, and listen, there are pockets of people, pockets of Jewish people scattered throughout the entire world. Now listen, the price of their purchase is the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. I gave you a reference there in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. It says, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I also gave you there Isaiah 52 and verse 3. You can look this up later. It says this, For thus saith the Lord, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now, next thing you want to write down here, the church age. The church age, in your notes here, the church age is just a short interlude. It's an insertion into God's larger plan to redeem and to restore his covenant people of Israel. Listen, the the promises made to Abraham and to his descendants, listen, those were not nullified in the church. Those were not nullified by Jesus. They were fulfilled in Jesus. And listen, during this age, do Jewish people need to put their faith and trust in Christ to go to heaven? You better believe they do. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. But listen, my friend, listen, the church age is going to come to an end. It started with Jesus. Jesus founded a church. And then at Pentecost, he empowered the church. And then, in, and then he sent the church out. And listen, my friend, when we get to the uh, beginning of the book of Revelation, the church is raptured out. And we're gone. But listen, God's plan and attention then moves back to his people. God's going to call up 144,000 Jewish evangelists, and they're going to go all through the nation of Israel. Then they're going to go all over the world, reaching not only their people, but all people in the name of Jesus. But the church is going to be gone. Now, you say, where's that in the Bible? Notice with me, uh, go back with me to the book of Romans. In the New Testament part of your Bible, go back with me to the book of Romans. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. Seventh book of the Bible, seventh book of the New Testament. Go with me to Romans chapter uh, 11. Romans chapter 11. Start with me in verse 25. Notice here, says this. And Paul is talking to New Testament Christians here. He said, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, or unknowing of God's mysterious plan lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. See, what happened was there were some New Testament Christians going, ha, look at us. Yeah, that's right. Woo-hoo, we're special. God loves us. And, and they were looking at the Jewish people and saying, God's done with you. All right, and the Paul said, whoa, whoa. Hold on a second. Actually, the Lord did. He said, listen, lest you be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Not all of the Israelis reject the Messiah. A lot of them have. But listen, some of them have not, not not in full, but in part. Listen, until, until 
the fullness of the Gentiles be come in, the end of the church age. Now, notice in verse 26, and so, what's that next word? Does God lie? Yes or no, does God lie? No. Does God exaggerate? Yes or no? No. And so, all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of uh, Zion the deliverer. That deliverer, is that a capital or a small d? That's capital. You know why? Because it's Jesus. And shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Why? For this is my covenant unto them, and when I shall take away their sins. Now, look at verse 28. In this age, in verse 28, during the church age, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as touching the election, meaning God's chosen promise for His people Israel, they are beloved for the Father's sake. You see that there? Listen, my friend, the church age, back to your notes, the church age is just a short interlude in God's larger plan to redeem and restore His covenant people Israel. They are His treasure. And they're a treasure that's buried and scattered throughout all the earth, but one day they will recognize Jesus as their Messiah. That's the next thing you want to write in. They will, you say, I don't know, where is that? Well, go back with me. Let, me. let me take you to one other verse here. Go back, We find the book of Matthew. All right, find the book of Matthew, and then keep going back, and you got Malachi, and then you find Zechariah. If I would have just told you to find Zechariah, you guys would have been like, where's that in the index, and where's that? But it's real easy to find Ma- uh, Zechariah. You find Matthew, and then you find Malachi, and then you find Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 12. Look at Zechariah chapter 12. Notice with me in verse 10, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. This is, of course, an Old Testament prophet uh, speaking to the Israeli, the Jewish people. Look at uh, Zechariah chapter 12. Notice verse 10. He says, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. Listen, my friend, salvation is always by grace and supplication. And they shall look upon who? Me. This is Jesus. Whom they have what? pierced. And the Bible says that whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is bitterness for his firstborn. Listen, my friend, when God raptures the church out, and when God raises up the 144 Jewish evangelists, listen, the blinders of the church age are going to be taken off, and listen, the light bulb's going to go on, and they're going to go, it's him. It's him, the guy that was pierced, this Jesus, he is the Messiah. And they're gonna, you know why they're going to mourn and cry? Because for 2,000 years, their, children, their mom and their dad and their grandma and their grandpa and their great-grandma and their great, they missed it. By the way, that's why you and I need to get the gospel to everyone. Listen, Jew and Gentile in this age. Listen, my friend, there's when the church is raptured out and God's focus and plan goes back to the Jewish people. Listen, the blinders are going to come off. And they're going to see and recognize that Jesus is their Messiah. And listen, just like the, what happened to the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul went from the crankiest, meanest, nasty opposition to the gospel to the guy who was the most passionate on fire for Christ. And that's what's going to happen all over the world. And Jesus said, listen, this is my treasure. These are my people. It's a wonderful thing. And so that is the treasure hidden in the earth. But he doesn't end there. Go back with me to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. So Jesus said, listen, my kingdom, what I'm building, listen, right now there are some parts of it that are hidden in the world, but he said, I love them, and I bought them, and I've redeemed them. But where does that leave us? Notice here in Matthew chapter 13, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls. Who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Oh, my friend. Listen, thank God Jesus didn't end there with the treasure hidden in the field, but he continued on with this second parable, the pearl of great price. In this parable, the kingdom of heaven is uh, also like a merchant man who is seeking goodly pearls, goodly pearls. And when he found one pearl of great price, he sold all that he possessed to purchase it. So we see the similarities. In in Israel, they were a treasure. Listen, there are many. But it's very interesting the symbolism Jesus uses for the church. Not multiple treasures, 
but one, the pearl. Now, does Jesus know what he's doing, yes or no? Absolutely. This is a wonderful truth we're going to get into tonight. This parable is similar to the first, but different in that the pearl represents the church. It represents the church. It also, by the way, individually represents you and I. And we're going to get into that. God's plan of salvation included both the Jew and the Gentile, not now in the church age as two separate people, but one new organism. Organism. You say, what does that mean to me? Hold your hand here, Matthew chapter 13. Go over with me to Ephesians in chapter 3. Ephesians in chapter 3. Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, and then Ephesians. Ephesians and chapter 3. This is where we have to understand that at different times and in different ways, God uh, works in different ways in different times. Why? Because He's God. Amen? And God is allowed to do whatever God wants to do, when He wants to do it, how He wants to do it. And right now, during this time, listen, we're not to be two separate groups of people, but one. Notice with me here in Ephesians chapter 3, notice verse 3. Well, let's back up to verse 1 for context. He says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given uh, me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. All right? Uh, The mystery is something that God hid but now is made revealed. As I wrote afore in a few words, he talked about this in chapter 1, Whereby, when you read, ye may know and understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What is this mystery, this hid thing? Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Notice here, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs, notice this, of the same body, and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You see that? When Jesus came to this earth and he started his work, listen, he started with the Jewish people. But then he opened his arms and he included the Gentile people. But now he's like, listen, you're not, you people aren't over here and you people aren't over here. He says, no, we are one new work, one new body, the church. Now, The purchase price, look at your notes here, the purchase price is the same. It's the blood of Christ. But the pearl represents not many pieces of a treasure, but one single pearl, one treasure um, of great price. One single treasure of great price. Now, why would Jesus use the pearl? Well, the pearl is a perfect picture of the church or what the church should be in that it is unified. The pearl is one pearl. Notice with me, turn with me if you will, uh, to Romans chapter 12. Go back with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, and let me explain the significance of that. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5. What was God's plan for His church? Why is this different than Israel? Notice here in Romans chapter 12, and verses 4 and 5. For as, okay, God's going to use a, 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 another word picture. All right, everybody look up here. Everybody look up here. All right, everybody wave your fingers at me. All right, wave your fingers at me. Okay, point to your ears. All right, your eyes, your nose. Okay, all right. So you have fingers, toes, knees, eyes, all that. But how many of you are there? There's one you, right? Are there many parts to the one you? Yes or no? Yes, many parts make up the one you. And so God is going to use that picture to illustrate his body, the church. Look here. He says, for as ye, as we, have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. Your nose doesn't do what your fingers do, okay? Now, so we Christians being many, listen, are how many? One body in Christ. And every one members one of another. 
Listen, Jesus' plan in the church is to take all these separate groups of people, people from here and people from there, and and different uh, men and women, uh, all different races, all different ethnicities. Listen, bring them together in one body. That is the church. Go with me. You're in in, uh, Romans. Go with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 1 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. This is why Jesus uses the picture of the pearl as a picture of what he intended for the church to be. Paul says this, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind, and in the same judgment. God's plan and God's purpose is to bring His people in the church as to one singular treasure. Now, what about those pearls? What's what's so special about a pearl? Notice in your notes here, the pearl has been long considered one of the most precious gems in the whole world. And, And it's alongside diamonds and rubies and emeralds and all those wonderful things, but there's something different about a pearl. You see, a diamond, a a, a ruby, an emerald, listen, you go out and you mine those up out of the earth. Not so with the pearl. The pearl is uniquely different. But the pearl is uniquely different in that it is formed from a living organism. A living organism. How does that happen? An irritant, and this is where the picture of you and I come in. And the picture of why the pearl represents the believer and the church. Listen, how does a pearl form? An irritant is introduced to uh, a pearl-producing oyster, and the oyster covers that irritant. The oyster covers that, in- that, that irritant. And listen, you say, well, what does that mean to me? So it is with the sinner The judgment of his sins, your sins, my sins, was the pain of Christ in forgiving that sin. And in forgiving that sin, listen, the sinner is now covered in the righteousness of Christ. I gave you that reference here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. You're in Corinthians. Just go over with me, would you, would you please? 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. If, if you don't have, if you say, Pastor, I, I struggle with what verses to memorize, this would be a great Bible verse to memorize. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, the Bible says this, now the He here, for He, God, had made Him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You see, why did Jesus choose the pearl, and why would it have such a a great price? Now, it's interesting. If you do a study on pearls, you'll find that there were times in the Roman Empire, the uh, the Egyptian Empire, that pearls were even considered more rare and more special than even diamonds and rubies and emeralds. Because to find one perfect pearl, listen, they had to go through millions of imperfect pearls. Such was the value of the pearl. The story is told of Queen, uh, queen Cleopatra, who was the queen of Egypt. And, and when the Romans were coming down and they were trying to make Egypt a vassal state, uh, the, uh, she wanted to display the wealth and the power of Egypt. And she said to Mark Antony, she said, listen, I'll consume in one meal the wealth of an entire nation. And from the treasures of Egypt, they brought out the most perfect pearl It was in the Egyptian treasures, truly a pearl that was of great price, and it was greater than the wealth of many nations. And Queen Cleopatra had in her hand, true story, you can look it up, had in her hand a a, 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 a grape vinegary type drink, and she took that pearl and dropped it and dissolved the pearl of great price and drank it. And truly, she consumed in one meal the wealth of an entire nation. It was simply to demonstrate the wealth and the power of Egypt blew Mark Anthony away. Listen, the truth is theirs. Listen, the pearl represents a great, rare treasure. You see, what happened was there was a day 
that you and I, listen, we entered into Christ. We and our sin were that irritant. Listen, Jesus paid the price for my sins and your sins. Now, what happens when that irritant gets into Christ? It's an instantaneous thing. It happens instantly, all right? But then over a period of time, and that's a picture of salvation. Salvation is instantaneous. But over time, listen, the pearl, here's your $5 word for the day, acreates. Ooh, okay, acreates. It covers the pearl. It puts a lustrous, beautiful covering. It takes away the irritant and it covers it with itself. That picture is a picture of what happens to you and I. When we were nothing more than an irritant, a sinner separated from God, and we were entered into Christ, listen, His precious blood covered us. It's a picture of salvation. Now, a pearl doesn't form overnight. What happens is over time, that, that, that oyster continues to cover and cover and cover and grow and develop. You know what that's a picture of? It's a picture of sanctification. And the end result and the end product of that pearl, um, the, in your notes here, the irritant is introduced to the pearl producing oyster, and the oyster covers that irritant. Now, <clears throat> let me go on down here. The process of making the irritant into a pearl, listen, it, pearl, it takes a long time. That's the process of sanctification. Let's go to one last place. What is the end result? Go with me to Ephesians, Ephesians in chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, the Lord uses yet another illustration. Let me illustrate. Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to go to verse 25. God uses another illustration of how beautiful how perfect, how precious the church is to him. Now, it's interesting that pearl is not many different pearls, but one pearl. Do you know that you individually were a pearl of great price to Jesus? Do you know that? You were a pearl of great price. Listen, your sin was an irritant to Christ. Your sin was the pain of Christ on the cross. He died not for, yes, he died for the sins of the whole world, but it has to be personal. He died for your sins. And thank God, Jesus, as you entered into Jesus, listen, he covered you with his righteousness. He made you, listen, listen, I'll make it personal for me so you don't get offended. Jesus took me, and I was nothing but a piece of trash. But when I entered into Christ, listen, he covered me with his blood, and he gave me his righteousness, and he turned me into a treasure. That's a precious truth of the pearl. And God continues to cover me with His righteousness, and listen, and, and He continues to grow me, and it's a picture of sanctification and growth. And what is the end of this? Notice here in verse 25, it says, husbands, love your wives, even uh, as Christ also loved the church, not church has, the church, the one, the pearl, and gave Himself for it. Why? So that He might sanctify. That means to bring it to Himself and cleanse it with washing of water by the Word. Now notice verse 27 and verse 28. Verse 27, that He might present it to Himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. It's the picture of the pearl. It's the picture of the wonderful riches of Christ. Listen, you and I look at ourselves and we're deeply flawed. You know what we see? We still see the trash. We still see the irritant. We still see the sin. But listen, God sees us as covered. God sees us already is perfected in Christ as the pearl of great price. Listen to me. God brings us together as the church. It's a wonderful picture. Jesus said, listen, let me pull back the pictures, of the, the curtains of heaven. He said, I know everything you see down here. It looks discouraging. It looks daunting. It looks like it's all for naught. But Jesus said, listen, let me show you what I see. I see treasure. That's what I see. Listen, let me give you make some personal applications here. It's in your notes. Number one, applications from these two parables. Number one, God is not hindered by either the tares of the devil, the destructive working of mankind. Listen, it doesn't diminish the value of each individual sinner and the treasure. Number two, 
God views his people as priceless treasure. That'll, that'll change your life. If, if God is just the mean old man upstairs trying to get even with you and trying to keep you in line, listen, it, that changes your uh, total relationship with God. But when you recognize that God looks at you and says, that's one of the most priceless treasures, you think of how, how you care for a treasure. You think of how, well, I don't know, what's the most value, you, you think in your mind, what's the most valuable thing you own right now? The most valued possession, and how do you guard that? How do you care for that? How do you steward that? That's how God sees you. That'll change your life right there. Number three, number three, God is not done with Israel. Please don't make no mistake. Yes, do people in the church age, must they be saved? Must they be a part of the body of Christ? Must they put their faith in Christ? Absolutely, there's salvation in no other way. But listen, my friend, the church age is going to come to an end. God's not done with his people Israel. Don't write them off. All right. And then lastly, God is building and polishing his pearl, which is the church, which is each one of us. Wonderful truths from these two parables tonight. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening, and we thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you for this wonderful truth. Lord, just, just a few little verses, but yet, Lord, when we, when we unpack them, when we unlock the truth that lies underneath, Lord, it, it, just, it, it grows into a, a, a massive, massive, Lord, wonderful, beautiful truth and picture. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for being the master parable teacher. And Lord, we thank you for these wonderful truths. Lord, Truly, Lord, you would have had to fill volumes, Lord, and yet in your wisdom, God, you condensed it down, Lord, to almost just a few single sentences. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us these truths. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful, uh, Lord, balance of Scripture, Lord, that unlocks these truths for us. And Lord, help us, Lord, as we understand your, Lord, we see your plan from your perspective. Lord, I think most of all, I just want to say thank you. Lord, what a wonderful thing it is, Lord, that you can turn trash into treasure. God, thank you, Lord, for taking us, Lord, flawed, irritating people, deeply marred by sin. Lord, and how, God, I just think of, uh, Lord, how many times I have to have irritated you. Lord, like that grit of sand in that pearl, in that oyster. And yet, Lord, you've covered me. And yet, Lord, you're perfecting me. And yet, Lord, one day you'll present me to yourself as a glorious treasure. Lord, thank you for that. Father, I pray that we would hold on to these truths. And Lord, that they'd make a difference in our lives. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand this evening, heads bowed and eyes closed as the instruments begin to play a verse of invitation. Maybe you just want to thank the Lord for saving you.